Welcome to the Research Reimagine podcast, brought to you by Nottingham Trent University. I'm your host, Helen Darby Dowman, and I'll be inviting some of NTU's brightest minds to explore how their research is helping us to deepen our understanding of the world. From online addictions to transgender rights and sleep disorders, listen as we discuss some of society's most pressing challenges and uncover some of the ways our research is making a difference. Please note we'll be talking about topics of sensitive nature, including violence, crime and sexual assault, which might be triggering for some listeners. For more information and signposts to support, please check the episode description. Sleep is something many of us take for granted, with the average person spending almost one third of their life asleep. With sleep taking up so much of our lives, many of us don't really think about what happens when we shut our eyes at night. For example, did you know around one in four children sleepwalk between the ages of two to 13? 7% of the adult population in the UK are sleepwalkers and in in extreme cases sleepwalking has led to people wading into freezing water, falling out of windows and even death. Recently a man in India made the news for mutilating himself with a knife because he was dreaming about cutting up meat for a family meal. In today's episode we're going to be exploring the fascinating subject of sleep. What is going on inside our heads when we sleep? Why do some people sleepwalk and others don't? And what happens when our dreams take a fateful turn? Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Research Reimagined Podcast. With me today, we have Professor John Groger. Hello, Helen. A psychologist who is also an expert in the psychology of sleep. And lecturer John Rumbold. Hello. Who is a forensic sleep researcher for Nottingham Law School here at Nottingham Trent University. Thank you so much for joining us today. So to get us started, could you please explain a little bit about what a sleep psychologist and a forensic sleep researcher does and how you both got into your topics? So I'm a cognitive psychologist by training. That is, um, I suppose, my interest has been since my PhD in learning memory attention. And I suppose I've been particularly interested in how people do things without really devoting a lot of attention to that um, task, whatever. So uh, a lot of my work has been on driving. We often have the experience, for example, of driving along and not being able to remember the last 10 minutes or whatever, despite having driven well. And quite some time ago now, I had a wonderful opportunity to meet an outstanding sleep researcher. And he asked me if I was interested in collaborating to try to measure performance when people were sleep deprived. And that, 25 years ago, really established for me this picked up on an interest, I suppose, that was there at the beginning about how people, what people can do when they're not really intending to do something, deliberately, consciously intending to do it. And that's sort of how I got into sleep research. Initially, background idea about what's unconscious, then opportunity to measure the effects of sleep loss. And since then, I've done a lot, a very broad range of sleep-related work. Hi. um, Well, I'm medically and legally qualified. And I first um, got interested in the way that the law deals with scientific issues, when a colleague told me about the the case of of Kenneth Parks, um, it wasn't given in particularly good detail, but it intrigued me, this idea that somebody could drive uh, across Toronto and then kill somebody, and this would be attributed to sleepwalking. So I I talked to uh, a neurologist who said, well, there's absolutely no way this could happen, um, which probably isn't the case. Um, and so when I did my, my legal conversion course, I wanted to carry on with this, this issue and I wrote one of my uh, essays on this and then eventually published an article on it. And this seemed to be fertile ground for doing the PhD that I did on expert evidence uh, and the sleepwalking defence. So I guess before we get into too much detail, it probably makes a lot of sense for us to maybe explore what or for you to maybe, John, to explain to us how an expert actually defines sleep. So the standard definition of sleep is that it's a reversible state. That means it's one that starts in one place and changes back to another place um, of reduced alertness and responsiveness. That is, we can only respond to an extent. We're only alert to an extent. Um, and, and that's they're the key features of sleep. 
Um, it's unlike coma because coma isn't necessarily um, isn't necessarily reversible. It's not like anesthesia. Um, it's something that happens, of course, for all of us um, on a on a daily basis. So it's limited alertness, limited responsiveness, and that reversibility, that change from being fully conscious and alert and capable of engaging in conversation, for example, um, and seeming, most of our experience probably, is as if the lights have turned out and we've switched off. Um, but I suppose the thing that I would like people to realise is that our brains are fascinatingly active right across the night. Our brains do all sorts of processing and things like thinking, whether it's thinking or not, it's a separate issue. But a great deal of activity goes on in the brain and it goes on in a very lawful and predictable way and it enables us to process the information from the day before, to prepare for the next day, uh, to repair our bodies and so on. Yeah, so as you've just mentioned, you know, we're all aware that we need sleep and sleep helps us to perform and, and live a, you know, have a really great day. And, I, and that's quite a sticking topic for many people, you know, whether we sleep, whether we don't. Um, can you just talk to me a little bit about what actually happens to the brain? First thing to realise is that we, um, we have sleep cycles and depending on your age, you'll have four to six cycles per night. They're about 90 minutes long. And to a greater or lesser extent, those cycles run from you being awake in through a very light stage of sleep, which is almost not sleep, almost waking, called stage one sleep. Stage two sleep is where we would uh, clinically and scientifically divine to find sleep is beginning. What happens in stage two sleep is that the brain becomes much less active than it is during stage one or during waking. And then we move through down the cycles where the wheel turns and we go into stage three sleep. At this point, our brain, more of our brain is responding or acting in a sort of concerted way. It's in synchrony with itself, much more so than in waking. So in waking, for example, uh, I'm talking to you. I'm uh, looking at uh, the earphones you're wearing and I'm thinking about what I'm going to do next. A whole range of things. I'm doing all of the time that multitasking. Everything I do uh, is because of activity in my brain. So imagine the brain's very active, but it's doing different things in sleep. What happens is that that activity or some of those activities will still go on. But it's isolated to particular parts of the brain and it's uh, specific to particular parts of the night. So we'll start with waking. We'll then drift uh, very quickly through stage one sleep when we're very easy to wake up. Stage two sleep will last a bit longer. And at times during it, it will be very hard to wake us. But mostly it's easy to wake from that early sleep. Stage three, more of the brain in synchrony, um, which means that more of the brain is doing the same thing, whatever that thing is. Harder to wake still. Stage four, very deep sleep, very hard to rouse, but still substantial amounts of brain activity. But it tends to be not so much in the thinking bits of the brain, the frontal bits of the brain, but deeper down in central areas of the brain. And then we come out of that, we go through back through stage three, stage two, stage one, then REM sleep, the one that most people know about, rapid eye movement sleep. People tend to think of that as dream sleep. It's not actually. We dream in every single phase of sleep. It's just that the type of brain activity which occurs during REM sleep uh, is, has lots of different types of sensory information available to the brain at that stage. And it tends to coordinate things in such a way that it becomes easier to report the dream. And the dream will have more sensory information, color, sound, touch, and so on and so forth, integrated. And then we may wake very briefly, 
And that whole cycle, as I said, 90 to 120 minutes, will repeat systematically across the night. All of those stages will occur, but what will tend to happen is that while in the first stage we have very little REM sleep, most of our slow wave sleep, or stages three and four, will be in the first hour or so of the night. And by the last cycle of the night, we have almost no deep sleep. Much more REM sleep, uh, but predominantly stage two. And that's the reason why it's, it's easy for us to wake towards the end of the night, where it's much harder for us to wake um, at various stages towards the beginning of the night. Once we've gotten over that, once we're into deep sleep, very, very hard to wake us. But we move through this cycle of being wakeable, non-wakeable, being able to respond to stimuli, being able to um, carry out, I'm going to say motor activities. Um, and, and that's to just distinguish that from deliberately doing something, uh, which we might call acting. But we can have motor activities during sleep. So you toss and turn because you're uncomfortable. That's a motor activity. If something is um, irritating your, your nose, you brush your nose. Um, so there's a sort of reflex-like simple activity that runs through lots of sleep. And I suppose the final bit of that picture is that while we're capable of um, motor activity throughout sleep, there's one point at which we are not, and that is during REM sleep, that thing that people call dream sleep, because our body goes into a state of paralysis temporarily. And other than our eyes in that rapid eye movement sleep, <laughs> other than our eyes, uh, the rest of our bodies are as if they're par it's paralysed. Can you talk to me a bit about sleep disorders that affect people as a whole? So according to um, the sort of standard sources, there are somewhere between 60 and 80 different definable sleep disorders. Most of us uh, would never be aware of them, but one, for example, that people might be aware of is something called bruxism, although they'll have no idea what that is. But that grinding of teeth during the night, uh, which is um, not particular to children, but, but tends to be something children do, that's a sleep disorder. Probably the one that people are most familiar with is sleep apnea, and that's where you temporarily um, but very frequently lose the ability to breathe. Um, so people will have 10 to 20, perhaps even 30 episodes of feeling that they're choking and unable to breathe per hour right across the night. So that's sleep apnea, and, and it's very serious and also very curable. Um, something that people don't think perhaps is a sleep disorder, but is actually the most prevalent one, is insomnia. The inability to sleep is a sleep disorder, which may seem um, slightly like a sort of gymnastic reasoning. But um, it's estimated somewhere, um, certainly in the adult population, somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 percent of people will have um, insomnia or some of its symptoms um, on a regular basis. So really quite prevalent. So in terms of these 60 to 80 different ones, I suppose the thing that is worth recognizing for this discussion, most prevalent is insomnia. I think that's not quite relevant here. There are a class of um, sleep disorders to do with breathing, probably not relevant here. There are a class of sleep disorders to do with um, movement control. Now, now, this may on the face of it seem relevant, but I'm talking about uh, the feeling of having um, uh, pins and needles or or jerky movements during sleep. They happen they're called periodic limb movements. Um, tends to be older people, uh, more prevalent in females. They're not. They're like like movement jittery movements, really effectively. Um, but probably the most relevant ones are uh, a class called parasomnias. That is where there is something over and above the normal sleep process which is occurring. So it's not that it's um, completely different to sleep. It's like an exaggeration of something that's typical of sleep. And it's a whole class called 
parasomnias. And that's, I think, where John comes in. Yeah, so John, obviously, your work in your, your forensic research obviously will be very much linked to these uh, sleep disorders. T talk to me a bit about how you've, or well, the research you've been doing, and, and those uh, disorders have the impact that they have on, on the research and the cases that you've been looking at. Um, the other areas that will have legal implications are when somebody becomes sleep deprived. So although insomnia and sleep apnea themselves don't cause legal issues if you fall asleep at the wheel then that's very definitely a legal issue um so yeah um it, it's something that rarely happens but the issue with parasomnias will be that you can commit what seems like actions it seems like you're deliberately doing something to a greater or lesser extent and you'll harm somebody in some way and then the crucial issue issue will be well is that person responsible or not? And that's a really tricky question. Um, one of the, so my research involved speaking to a lot of expert witnesses, just to understand how they gave evidence, what things went into their evidence, and then also looking at how the courts treated that evidence. So you have somebody who will be saying, this person may or may not have been sleepwalking. And then how do the courts deal with that? How can they assess that objectively? And how do the juries come to their decisions? Is it all just on the expert evidence? Or you know, are the, the juries able to understand and weigh up potentially conflicting expert evidence? Actually, in quite a lot of cases, it, it, it agrees substantially. What happens if someone does commit um, some kind of crime whilst they're asleep? I mean, is there anything in the UK that currently covers this? Yeah, there's certainly there's three different defences that the person could use. So the classic thing in the textbooks is that sleepwalking is an automatism. And the language used in the textbook is, is confusing, so I uh, tend not to use that. So they talk about insane automatism and non-insane automatism, which is, which is really cumbersome. So I tend to divide it into insanity and automatism, which makes things a lot clearer. Because it, it's very confusing for law students lawyers and, in, and indeed judges. So there have been mistakes judges have made. And I think the language is one of the reasons why they make these mistakes. So what automatism means is, um, as John was saying, when you're sleeping, you're not really acting. So we wouldn't say, well, that person deliberately did this. And that's the kind of thing that the law requires. So you're really acting like a robot. Um, somebody in one of the trials said, yeah, it's as if he's hypnotised those kind of things, or somebody's using the remote control. So the person isn't really in control of what they're doing. Um, and in terms of the law, what that means is if you have a total loss of voluntary control, so that it's not your mind controlling what you're doing, then you wouldn't be held responsible. And this is something that the lawyers could argue. However, what they tend to argue is that actually the person didn't have the necessary mind the, the the necessary intention so in law we talk about two aspects so you have a guilty act and you have a guilty mind and this is called in law actus reus and mens rea so we know that the person has definitely performed the harmful action whatever it is they won't be denying that but it's a matter of was their mind controlling those actions and that's easier to prove in court rather than that you had a total loss of voluntary control in some uh, and very hard to demonstrate scientifically yes yes so how do they go about trying to demonstrate this scientifically what is the sort of process for that what well, to show that somebody was sleepwalking at the time yeah. well as as one of the expert witnesses said to me is nobody can tell um only god uh, unfortunately because god is very often not available as an expert witness we have to rely on what we know of the signs. So all we can say is, is, are these actions consistent with sleepwalking? And there's a number of caveats as well. So if somebody has a motive and hostility, then we'll be a lot more dubious. And one of the things that all the expert witnesses agreed on is that they should have a history of sleepwalking. So if somebody commits an act, and this is allegedly the first time they've ever sleepwalked, then that should be dismissed by the court absolutely dismissed so there should be this background not that that's the whole issue because obviously proving somebody is asleep or just one step the next thing is proving they were sleepwalking at the time and um you know god and the person may know 
and the rest of us have to try and guess. Um, so we, we look at the kind of action. So, for example, if a sleepwalker is violent towards somebody, that should be a reaction to somebody that's close to them. And this is why you shouldn't try and wake a sleepwalker suddenly. You should gently guide them back to bed because otherwise they, they may hit you. You know, if you seem to be being aggressive to them, they're in this state where they're not in fully in control, but they're, they can do certain motor actions, which include potentially clouting you if you seem to be manhandling them before they you know, come to their full consciousness. Um, and people will, people will do, I mean, um, if, if four to seven percent of, um, of children go through this uh, and many all, almost all children will grow out of it of course um but there's you know that can be walking into the parents bedroom or whatever else in slightly older children it will often be going downstairs or going into the cupboard which i thought was the loo or whatever else those sorts of things which um are benign um harmless in other words um but but they are basically the seeds of something which in an adult much later um, can grow into a situation where very complex behaviors and very um, damaging behaviors can be carried out by the individual um, quite remarkably so as, as um, John has a number of cases which which demonstrate the complexity of the actions that people can undertake whilst sleepwalking John yeah have you got an example of a, of a sleepwalking defense Probably the best one in terms of a pure sleepwalking defence is the case of Brian Thomas, which fortuitously happened just after I started my PhD. I say fortuitously, obviously not for his wife. But um, Brian Thomas strangled his wife in a, a motor home in Wales. And it was a very clear case of, of the, the sleepwalking defence in that he loved his wife, he had no reason to kill her, and everything he described about the situation fitted entirely with a, a sleep disorder. And the experts were, you know, very much convinced and gave the same evidence that this guy had clearly been sleepwalking. Um, he was in the bed with his wife, he didn't have to move. He had this dream that somebody was on top of his wife and then he was trying to strangle them, but actually it was his wife he strangled. Then when he realised this, he phoned the police and said, I think I've killed my wife. So this really ticked, and he had this history of, of um, sleep disorders. Tragically, he had stopped taking his medicine because this affected him with erectile dys dysfunction and he wanted to have a romantic weekend. Um, and... All the family were, you know, saying that they had absolutely no reason to, to want to kill his wife. They had a very close, loving relationship. So this ticked every box for being a credible sleepwalking defence that it was genuine. And you see, the, the thing that's interesting there, if we think back to the sleep stages and what's possible during different sleep stages, uh, very typically sleepwalking uh, occurs during slow wave sleep. Because in REM sleep, if your REM sleep is intact, you don't have the motor capacity. You couldn't stand up. You couldn't carry out an action like that. And so it's interesting that it's a sleepwalking defense. I wonder whether uh, there's another type of parasomnia which might be relevant here as well, which is something called REM-based sleep disorder. Now, I mentioned that REM uh, you have this this very vivid um, sensory experience in your brain, which tends to inform and result in in quite uh, colourful and well structured dream recall. But typically, you have no power to act. Um, however, in REM based sleep disorder, that normal paralysis which accompanies REM sleep is not operating, and so people will act out their dreams. The other thing that tends to happen while slow wave sleep is largely uh, concentrated in the first part of the night mm -hmm. and REM sleep is typically concentrated in the later parts of the night, in REM-based sleep disorder, the REM is very unusual in that there's much more REM towards the beginning of the night in the first cycle um, and there's a high amount overall. And so that means that the person is having unusual amounts of REM lots of sort of um, vivid dreaming, I suppose, um, plus the capacity to act on those dreams is not actually 
present. So, sorry, they, they unusually retain the ability to act on what's in those dreams. And so my suspicion, but I don't know, is that this might have happened towards in the earlier part of the night rather than in the later part of the night. So I'd be tempted to argue that it's not so much a case of sleepwalking mm. as REM-based sleep disorder. That was certainly one of the possibilities. It was either a sleep terror or it was a, a REM, REM behaviour disorder, REM sleep behaviour disorder. So within that case then, what, what was the outcome? So he was acquitted, yes. Um, there was this issue of whether or not he should be found not guilty by reason of insanity. So when you have that raised, so this was put, put, going to be put to the jury, you have to have a psychiatrist who's approved by the Home Office um, pronounce on this. And they said, look, going to a special hospital is not going to benefit this person in any way. They were not going to be able to treat him and he's not dangerous. So therefore, the judge directed the jury just to acquit him. Um, the law has actually changed since that case. So you wouldn't actually send somebody to a special hospital anymore. It used to be that if it was homicide and you were pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, you had to go to a special hospital. So this happened in some other cases, for for example, the case of Lowe. Um, but this wouldn't happen anymore. They have modified the law. So you'd just be under medical supervision. And does the law differ between different countries? So in America, you'll find that the... Um, forensic psychiatric facilities are kind of crazy punitive it's quite harsh conditions so the experts there are very keen to say this is not a, a condition that requires further supervision in this country again the experts tend to not like um, to label this as insanity partly because they it's not a psychiatric condition but that's actually not what the legal term revolves around the actual cause of the disorder is whether or not it's affected your mind. Um, on the continent, very often it will be found as uh, insanity, but then they have uh, very much kinder conditions for the criminally insane there. So it doesn't make as much of a difference apart, obviously, from the label. But it will be a def there will be a defence available and it, all, all over the world. It's just a matter of whether it's insanity or whether it's the equivalent of automatism, which might be called unconsciousness. I think we tend to, to think of insanity as something which is relatively rare and unusual in the context of normal humans. Um, and it seems to me to be odd to push the view that it relates to insanity if a substantial number of our children actually go through this state um, for several years, usually before puberty. I mean, this was the thinking in the Canadian court. So in the, the, the case of Parks I mentioned before, they said this is arising from sleep and sleep is very definitely not insanity. It's just a normal part of human life. So they said, well, therefore, he cannot be found insane. Interestingly, later on, there was a different type of special verdict that came uh, was was provided for in Canada called not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder. And then this was also applied to uh, another sleepwalking case. Um, so there, there were some issues around the fact that he was just acquitted because actually Kenneth Parks did have some mental health issues. So it wouldn't have been unreasonable, but this is on the grounds that they said sleep can't be, can't be insane. So you mentioned very early on about the Kenneth Parks case, and obviously this was something that came to you very early on in... Uh... In your research, you, can you just talk us again through that? I mean, it is really hard to understand when you read anything about it that somebody can function the way he did and, and claim it was all in sleep. You know, talk, talk to me about that case. Yes. Um, the reason why I didn't mention it is a really good example of a sleepwalking defence is because it, it's very divisive. And some sleepwalking experts are convinced he was sleepwalking. Others think it was something different. Um, a sleep-related dissociative state. And I tend to agree with the latter. So this this guy, he was a big man, um, which actually ties into his sleepwalking. So if you sleepwalk a lot, you tend to grow quite tall because you get more growth hormone release. So he had this uh, long... And that's history. just incidentally, in case anybody is advocating sleepwalking in order to um, to get bigger. Um, growth hormone is secreted 
um, by all of our systems in the early part of the night during slow wave sleep. And it tends to happen that sleepwalking occurs during slow wave sleep. So so let's not um, let's not encourage our children to sleepwalk. Um, so Kenneth Parks was this gentle giant of a man who had a long history of sleepwalking. He had a lot of family members that had sleepwalking or, or similar things like bruxism and um, bedwetting. So he seemed to have, get a big dose of the sleepwalking genes. Um, he was under a lot of personal stress. So he'd been gambling, had debts, and he had to go and talk to his in-laws the next day. And talking to the in-laws can often be a stressful process anyway. Um, so this was going through his mind. So going back to what John said about preparedness for the next day, one of the theories was that this was going through his, his sleeping brain what he was going to have to do the next day. So he, in some sort of state, whether it was actual sleepwalking or sleep-related dissociation, drove 23 kilometres across Toronto. He had to go through at least one set of traffic lights. Nobody witnessed this, but we know what whatever route he'd take. He had to negotiate traffic lights. Then when he got to the house, he killed his mother-in-law and he seriously injured his father-in-law. And there's lots of things he did that suggest he was at least in a dissociative state. So there were children upstairs and they observed this happening. And they observed this kind of grunting. And, you know, if you, if you see somebody sleepwalk, often you can see they're not quite in touch with their environment. Although that's not always true. So coming back to children sleepwalking, I spoke to one expert witness who had seen his own children sleepwalking. And he could only tell for sure if they had been sleepwalking by talking to them to the next day to see what they remembered. So it can be very difficult. And typically people remember, uh, don't remember anything about these incidents, a little like night terrors. So the, the sort of, we make distinction between night terrors, which, which some parents um, might think is, is like the child having a nightmare. But it's actually very different. In a nightmare, the child wakes from sleep and complains about how upsetting a dream was. In a sleep terror, there is no waking. The, the child is quite definitely asleep. They're just unresponsive to the outside world. And whatever inner uh, trauma is being rehearsed uh, seems to come out in terms of shouts and some movement and so on and some distress. So it's... Um, these sort of nuances that that sleep experts would make it's something that the law is 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 quite blind to i think yeah um and so what um kenneth parks next did so once he'd committed these this harm he then goes to the police station and he says i think i've killed somebody and that's very telling so when somebody is sleepwalking um they lose the ability to recognize faces so they can see a bit of their environment which is why they can navigate around uh, a room for example their eyes will be open but if they wouldn't recognize something that's entirely familiar to them so he was saying i think i've killed somebody but he didn't recognize it, it was his father and his mother-in-law he'd killed and also injured his father-in-law he also had extensive cuts up his arm from the knife so when he'd been putting the knife in, his, his arm would slid over the blade and he had to have extensive tendon repairs. And he he was oblivious to this. So this is the sort of thing that it, it seems unlikely that you could fake. Um, I mean, this is always the the big problem is, can somebody be faking this? Um, and these kind of details don't seem consistent. And he just went to the police and said, I've committed this crime. So again, that's that fits with the whole story of not trying to avoid blame at all. Um, he wasn't entirely sure what happened, but he'd seen the result. And you can have some partial memories of what you did, not obviously for complete memories. Um, so that all fitted with it being some sort of parasomnia, even if it wasn't sleepwalking, but this related thing. The reason why it would make a difference is if it's a sleep related dissociation, that's definitely uh, a mental health condition. So that's a result of you having some mental health issues. And he was under a lot of stress. And so therefore, the insanity defence would definitely be wholly appropriate that you have some supervision that helps you deal with the issues that have caused these dissociative, dissociative states to, to occur.
One point that, that John made there um, about Kenneth Parks was the, the tendon damage that he had. And you might imagine, my goodness, if you were going through that amount of pain, he would surely wake up. But even the more innocuous um, versions of sleepwalking, people will often bang their foot on something or um, knock up against something, and they don't wake. And they may wake in the morning with bruising. Um, so they quite evidently did hit things. They quite evidently must have been in pain in order to sustain the bruise. But they will have, they neither wake nor do they have any recollection of it afterwards. So it's possible, but my sense of um, John's, uh, John's depiction of the Parks case is that there's rather too much uh, complex activity going on over too long a period of time. Uh, for it to be a, a sort of an example of sleepwalking. I, I think it's more likely that there was some other underlying mental conditions supporting that. Like take slightly different cases. So like the, the Selby train driver, obviously this is talking more about sleepiness um, and falling asleep. You know, can you talk to me a bit about that case and then a little bit about the science around sleepiness and sometimes how that contradicts the general view of the courts? Well, I'll go into the details of Selby, then I'll let John talk about the, the science. So, um, as we mentioned before, if somebody falls asleep, and typically it will be falling asleep at the wheel, then there can be catastrophic consequences. So, uh, in the Selby um, rail crash, there was a gentleman called Gary Hart, who had not slept the night before, and he was going on a journey in his Land Rover, um, towing a, a trailer with a car on it, and he, he fell asleep at the wheel in his vehicle went down the embankment from the M62 onto the rail line, um, got stuck there, an intercity train hit his car, derailed, and then a freight train coming from the other direction um, crashed into the intercity, and 10 people were killed. Um, obviously, lots more injured and, and psychologically traumatised as well. Um, he said that he had driven many times in a similar state of sleep deprivation, um, but nonetheless, he was found guilty. He had fallen asleep, and the, the view of the courts is, if you fall asleep whilst driving, you should have had some something that warned you that you were about to fall asleep. Alternatively, you might say, well, to be that sleep deprived and drive anyway, you could argue that's creating the risk. So that. Although you can't be held guilty for things that you do whilst you're asleep, you can be found guilty for putting yourself in a risky situation. Um, and this is the, the, the central doctrine here. It's OK, you did something silly that made you fall asleep. So therefore, we can find you at fault. And he was convicted of causing death by dangerous driving and he was sentenced to five years in prison. And so that's a, it's a very interesting example because... One of the things that um, you know uh, will invariably happen when we become sleep deprived, we, we do a lot of work on sleep deprivation here at NTU, um, is that people's reactions will slow. Um, people's ability to process information will reduce. And so the sort of nuts and bolts of what might be involved in driving will deteriorate. Um, but they'll deteriorate slowly over a long period of time. Now, if you lose one night's sleep, the, the effects aren't catastrophic. Uh, they can be if you're unfortunate enough to be in a situation where that loss of performance is found out by the world around you, in a sense. Um, it will take multiple days of sleep deprivation for you to actually get into a state where you're almost finding impossible to retain to, to maintain wakefulness so i think that's one thing for people to to realize yeah things do deteriorate when we lose just one night's sleep usually the next night it puts it all right again uh, but if if that goes on for a period of time then you will get this gradual degradation and for some things where you don't need to attend all the time um, that performance loss won't be that evident. But of course, in a case like driving, um, for example, if you're driving on a motorway late at night and there's nothing else around, the amount of attention you need 
in order to drive safely is pretty minimal. Um, however, there can be a car stopped on the hit, on the hard shoulder, which isn't illuminated, that you don't spot. There may be a degree of curvature on the motorway that you fail to correct, and suddenly you're in a situation where that extra capacity to react accurately and quickly uh, becomes challenged, and you have a problem. So that that's that's one thing I suppose I'd say about deterioration. the The other thing that people tend to say in cases like this is that the person had a micro sleep. That is a very very brief period, uh, seconds, literally. So you can't micro sleep for a minute. Um, that's being asleep. But a micro sleep is typically uh, maximally about fifteen seconds, um, during which you're unresponsive and not attending. But I suppose if you think about it, um, that micro sleeps are, are certainly do occur. But if you think about it, um, the the operating standards for navigation systems in cars, for example, um, mean that uh, at one point um, the standard, the design standard, was that it must require no longer than seven seconds of attention off the road in order for the system to be safe. So it couldn't, the task couldn't occupy more than seven seconds, I believe it was. And so there's the acknowledgement that your eyes don't have to be on the road all the time. Your mind doesn't have to be on the road all the time in order to drive safely. Uh, and there are some really odd studies, again in Canada, I don't know what it is about Canada, John, um, but where um, people looked at what the minimum t visual time you would need in order to drive safely would be. Uh, and a chap that I, I've met actually, so he survived these experiments, uh, would drive along with something like a crash helmet on. And the visor would come down and block his vision completely for a period of time and then would open up again. So, so the notion that your attention needs to be on the road all the time um, or on the task all the time really doesn't run as far as I'm concerned. So even though microsleeps do occur, um, I'm not so sure how relevant they are to the notion that people have accidents. Of course, you can have a critical circumstance in which you know, if the timing is absolutely on the nail where these things go inside, you're going to have a problem. The other bit of that whole case that, that bothers me a bit is the notion that we know when we're falling asleep. Um, my sense is that what we know is that somebody has told us we're falling asleep or our head jerks down and we jerk back up again and we realize that we have fallen asleep temporarily. But it's not that we know it's going to happen. And that's, you know, if you don't know it's going to happen, then it's very hard to protect yourself against it, is what I would argue. So taking it back, say, to the law, I mean, do you believe in sleepwalking defence? Yes, but most of the inquiries by lawyers are bogus. So when I talk to the expert witnesses, they estimated between 80 and 90 percent of the inquiries were just garbage. And that I've had a similar experience when I've had people ask me for opinions. Um, and sometimes that's just a lack of knowledge. It isn't necessarily lawyers uh, chancing their mitt, but there have been some odd uh, scenario. So uh, a solicitor asked one expert about somebody who'd bashed somebody over the head uh, in the middle of the day in a pub, you know, could this be sleepwalking? And the answer was an emphatic no, because this guy clearly wasn't asleep. He had to sleepwalk out of sleep. So, you know, um, and it has been difficult in the early stages, particularly with sex somnia, because the Crown Prosecution Service and the police didn't really know how to deal with these things. And it became what one expert witness described as a barrister's playground. But now there's a bit more understanding about the issues and then the evidence gets tested. This is where the legal issues become very important because if you are going down the automatism or lack of men's rare route, then it, the burden is on the prosecution to prove their case. If you're saying that the person has to plead insanity, then they have to prove that the person had this condition on the balance of probability. So they have to make the run-in. 
So this makes a big difference. And this is why, personally, I believe that the court should be requiring defendants to argue insanity because then they have to provide more robust evidence. Um, I think the sleepwalking defense is is perfectly reasonable and plausible. But I've also got a but. Uh, and that is that um, I think it's much, much harder to substantiate um, than people might realize. Um, and the more we find out about how sleep works and what's possible and not possible, what's typical and atypical in sleep, the harder it is to make that case, I think. It, it makes it possible, but frankly, I think not very likely. A lot of activity, a lot of uh, thought is possible during sleep. Um, but very elaborate activity uh, at a point where uh, the individual perhaps stands to gain uh, very majorly from from saying, I had this condition, I would always be very sceptical. So then for all the sleepwalkers out there, you know, should they be alarmed? And, and if, you know, is there anything they can do to sort of avoid these incidents? So in terms of sleepwalking, um, a large uh, proportion of children will sleepwalk. It seems to be, an, a, a, it's so widespread um, that I think it's a sort of fairly typical aspect of young person's sleep. Um, clearly, if somebody has, if a child has a history of sleepwalking, it's something that often runs in the family, for example, um, then it's worthwhile trying to ensure that they can't do themselves any harm um, while sleepwalking. Um, post-puberty, um, the vast majority of these people grow out of it. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. I mean, sleep is a fascinating subject. It's something that consumes so, so many people's thoughts often about, have I got enough? Haven't I got enough? But we, I think we've entered a whole different world of, of sleep information today. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to follow John and John's research further, you can follow the links in the description. You've been listening to the Research Reimagined podcast by Nottingham Trent University. For all of the latest news from the research community at NTU, follow us on Twitter at NTU underscore research or sign up to our research newsletter by visiting ntu.ac.uk forward slash research. Thanks for listening.